So I'm here at uh, Telus Garden, uh, which is a building built by a $10 billion business in Vancouver. We're doing a talk today. It's our first business talk on Evolve. And uh, <laughs> it's been a busy couple of weeks. I hit three conferences, got my passport, still on a laptop, got an iPad, figured out how to use that. My iPhone basically blew up. It didn't work. It's crazy. Everybody's making this deck last minute. Um, I got it about 30 minutes ago, um, 30 minutes before getting here, and uh, just kind of worked through. Um, you know, what I think we're going to talk about. I mean, I'm passionate, so it's just going to be speak from the heart, but, um, but it's, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, we'll give it a go <laughs> and have some fun. I'd like to uh, introduce our next presenter, uh, Steve Curtis, who's the founder of Evolve Biologics, and he's got a very interesting uh, presentation uh, titled Improving Employee Wellness Through Radical Transparency. Now, when I did a little digging, I was quite intrigued. Let's welcome Steve. Okay, so I just got here. I don't exactly know how to use this, but <laughs> we're going to figure it out. Um, so I couldn't be with you here. I flew back just to do this talk. Uh, when Peter asked me, I originally um, was a little bit hesitant, too busy, but then he explained to me uh, who was going to be here, and I thought it might be a wonderful thing to be able to share with you the journey I've been on and some of the stuff we're working on. Um, as you'll see when we go through our talk, uh, it's a fairly ambitious adventure that we're on, and so maybe some of you in some way can be of support to that, uh, whether it be as people that join our platform or um, in some other way. And so I, I, um, I'm excited about sharing today. Um, when I speak about ambitious, what we're, we're really talking about is the next evolution in humanity. I think all of us um, share some level of concern about the future. If you have an Apple News feed or even YouTube, things are coming up daily that are, that are quite concerning. And in some ways, that's the same as it's always been. Um, in other ways, there's new stuff. Uh, you, we speak about artificial intelligence. Um, and, and some of that is part of our, our theme. I just want to understand the audience a little bit better. Uh, who's familiar with the idea of the technological singularity? Just a show of hands. OK, so not very many. <laughs> For the people that raised their hand, <laughs> they know that's a pretty big gap to cover in about two minutes. Um, so basically, technology is evolving to the point that the question is, do hum humans still control it? Does technology control us, or do we control it? And the, 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 the answer is a little bit of both. Uh, we see that with, with the changes in democracy and, and the changes in how people's behaviors and echo chambers are shifting into our understanding of the world as being ultra-polarized. Um, there's a lot of questions about how things emerge. And so my viewpoint is that the future world that we create starts with the individual. Um, and it, the individual forms into a movement, which really represents the potential of humanity itself on the planet. And um, it's about us connecting with ourselves and each other in an entirely new way. Because what technology has brought about is a future that's very hard to see. And so when we think about what the highest ideal is, we can use a concept like best life. But each of you living your best life is going to be a little bit different than, than my best life. I mean, that's part of the individuality of freedom and democracy and the, these ideas that have formed us together in a beautiful country like Canada. Um, but ultimately, we can see freedom going in different directions. And if we think about a future where technology creates a brighter path that we look forward and we say these things we're creating are going to create a better world, um, I say that's the best life. If we look at a future world where compassion and love and empathy and understanding are part of that, um, I would say that's a better life. And if we ultimately look at the world in a way that, that we care about the empowerment of others, you know, we can drive to work and just cover our eyes as we move through the downtown east side, or we can say these are real people that actually have stories much like us. You know, I was, um, I was in San Francisco last week. Um, Olivia is here with me. It's been a fairly stressful week for her because I parked my car right across from the restaurant. I left a few things in just to go in and meet somebody, and my car got broken into, and I made the rookie mistake of leaving my passport in there. Uh, <laughs> right? that's, that's quite the ordeal. So don't do that. If you haven't made that mistake, please don't do it. Um, but it worked out really beautifully because there was a gentleman who offered to help me try and find it. Uh, my laptop was in there too. 
and we went on an adventure around downtown San Francisco. And it's amazing to see that there are 8,000 people that live in a city where there's so much wealth, so much wealth has been created in that region, yet there's these huge swarms of people that just don't matter anymore. And so when we look forward to this, this future, a big part of this is, is, is the values that drive our movement. I'm going to get into what we're doing in a moment, um, but the, the elevation of humanity, not just the, the elite and the rich and the people that have been born into privilege, but, but for all of humanity is a core part of what powers us. Radical transparency is another part. I mean, sharing these stories about what's happening in my life, being able to share the things that scare us and the things that excite us. Um, and you'll see as we look at technology how, how scary it can be to actually be vulnerable and open. Um, courageous growth. Uh, we speak about something like the singularity. Um, these are things that have been written many years ago. And as Moore's law accelerates and artificial intelligence advances and quantum computing advances and nanotechnology advances, for many people in the world, it's hard to see what their purpose will be. It's beginning to be visible when we look at something like an occupation of a truck driver. You've had a life, you've made a good living, you've provided for your family, and now everything is robotic, so what now? And, and we see these massive issues emerging in society, and we have to deal with them. And so some people put their head in the sand and cover their eyes, but in our initiative, our business, our movement, it's about being very open and transparent about these things and confronting them. Um, I, don't know how many people will resonate on this idea, um, but it's something that I believe very deeply that for a long time humans have both lived in a spiritual world and a material world, and these things have been very separate. But now, even through the power of technology, things that would have been considered something that you should be burned at the stake for uh, long ago, now you are, are recognized as being a you know, trendsetter and on the edge of the curve. Uh, we also are confronted with some really interesting questions about what is a Newtonian physics model and a quantum physics model. And we see this in, in physics in the lab, but scaling it into the nature of how we live our lives is something that's been somewhat elusive. There's those spiritual hippies, and then there's those hardcore engineers. But collectively, that's merging in really interesting ways. Uh, recently, uh, the, the Chinese launched a, launched a satellite, and they used a principle called entanglement for their encryption. So there's actually no signal that moves between those, those satellites. It's, it's a quantum phenomenon that's moved into the communication of how humans work. We also see an emerging field of quantum biology, how birds navigate and photosynthesis happens. We're progressively discovering that the world is much more magic than we think it is, and even just by thinking about things, they change. Some of you may think I'm absolutely crazy, but there's a whole field of science that demonstrates this and personal experience for those people that have had these kind of experiences. And then finally, enlisting allies is about bringing people from different fields together to be able to share stories that seem like totally different worlds, but find that we have much more common ground than, than we think we do. And so this idea of creating this positive world based on these values, which we have, but we also in many ways are slotting away from, we just look at sort of leading politics these days, particularly down south a little bit, um, <laughs> we wonder about the future of the world. Um, and rightly so when we look at the stats. Last year in the United States, 50,000 people committed suicide. That's a pretty big number of people that just say life isn't worth living anymore. The stats for depression, anxiety are increasing. Exponential rates in new ways. We've become an overly medicated society. Everything is medication. Some people have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 medications they're taking. In some ways, we've forgotten to be human which is sort of take a breath and <laughs> relax and see some positives. Um, and, and this has created, um, uh, if we look at, say, like the opiate epidemic, right? It, it emerged from people that lost their job, inflammation increased, pain increased. They went to their doctor over and over again. And then some, some science that was carefully manipulated by corporate interests led doctors to feel good about prescribing and helping people. And then when those prescriptions went away, they ended up in the streets on, on heroin. 70,000 people, the last year of full stats that are transparent, 70,000 people died in the US in one year on opiate overdose. That's not including suicide. So you put those two together, and we see these massive amounts of people that have stopped wanting to live. And part of this reason is disconnection. We, we look at how people are, are connected. In village society, we used to be able to give each other a hug. Uh, it was common to connect and share truth and stories and pain. And now it's on the edge of a terminal with a few words, and we don't really know who we're talking with. So we've lost this human connection. Um, and so through technology, ironically, that a lot of people think pulls us apart, I believe there's an opportunity to reconnect people. 
And so we've identified this idea, this approach of what we call quantified consciousness. And this is measuring the, the biological rhythms of the body. You see this in some ways. Biofeedback is not new. If we listen to our heartbeat while we work out, it tells us what zones we're in. Um, but there's also another narrative that if we listen really, really closely, um, both with technology and without, we start to hear a different story. Um, I think probably most people can identify with the idea of either making decisions from your head or your heart. Who, who's, who's kind of been in a place where they could, no one, no one, is it, yeah, really? <laughs> so like 10% of the room has made decisions with either their head or their heart and can differentiate. Is that my conclusion? <laughs> okay, I, I think we, so who has made a decision in the past where it has been from either their head or their heart and they could clearly delineate which one it was? Okay, so almost everybody, good. So the reality is that there are different ways that we function, the various components of our, our, our existence, our brain and our heart are different components. And we see as people process and perceive reality that the rhythms of their body change. And now we have sensor technology that can measure that and also move that into a digital environment that sort of interprets who we are in a way that we can then use that information to gain greater insights. Am I making that decision from my heart? Is that aligned with, with the person in me that feels love and peace and joy? Or is that aligned with the person in me that feels frustration and violence? It's a complicated thing to determine as we just kind of wander through life in our environments. But what we're finding is we pull the rhythms through. There's an ability to utilize that information in a new way. And this is a lot of data for a slide, and it's you know a little bit complicated. But looking up in the light green, we have um, this sort of idea of sensor fusion. If I put the red button, does it go back? OK, how do I go back? There we go. Good, OK. So we have these various rhythms in the body, which we'll you know, talk about in a future talk, that come into a sensor fusion model that move into a machining, this machine learning model where we have algorithms that sense meaning by individual metric, but then also by collective metric, and then create adaptive content. So what is the content? If you're, if you're in anxiety, what is the feedback that you would like to, to, to hear? Has anyone used Calm or Headspace or any of those apps? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so most of it's static content that's provided, but if you have a challenge sleeping, you go on Calm and you're like, give me a digital therapeutic that helps me sleep. Instead of taking an Ambien and waking up with your car crashed in a ditch, you listen to a beautiful <laughs> children's story and you fall asleep and you're like, that was cool and you have a beautiful sleep. So this is what we're talking about, personalized adaptive content, which is the next step as we work through challenges. All of us have trauma of some kind. We see these stress moments and then deliver content. And this is part of a technology ecosystem that brings just the right information at the right time. Within a platform and ecosystem that we could define as a therapeutic alliance in psychology or a psych psychology practice, we would de define it as a therapeutic alliance. Um, and, and really, so, so that experience of being able to understand who we are in a moment, have visualization of that, have somebody kind of hold our hand through a platform, whether that be a person or, or technology that reminds us and says, hey, this might not be the best time to make a decision. We've all been in that situation where we get particularly stressed and we're like, don't make the phone call. Don't do the thing. Don't hit send. Just, just hold. <laughs> oh, well, I just did it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so sometimes that works out and sometimes not. But it usually almost always works better to take a breath and center. And so having that support for people all around the world, whether it's the person who works in the C-suite of this building or whether it's somebody who's just down the, down the street trying to figure out how to get rent or how to find stable housing or how to deal with the violence that they're experiencing on a daily basis. And this is what technology allows us to do is bring practices of wellness and well-being and awareness and emotional strength to everyone in a way that's incredibly powerful and real in the moment. Which then gets us to this place, I mean, words, right? Adaptive gamified ability enhancements. Which means we're in a platform, this quantified consciousness platform, and each of us are learning to be stronger and get closer to our best life. And so this all becomes, you know, very abstract. What does it mean to, to, have, to have your best life and get stronger and gain abilities? Um, anyone read anything by Maslow or heard of Maslow? Okay, okay, right, because Maslow was a fundamental part of psychology. Um, there's a couple things that, that, that people don't know about Maslow um, in the psychology textbooks. Um, he, uh, he was known for actualization. You see level five there. But actually, he had a whole body of work which didn't quite make the mainstream called transcendence, which is progressively becoming more and more relevant in an age where we don't know what comes next. 
Uh, if, you, if you ask a leading AI researcher when general artificial intelligence arrives, you'll get never. Um, the scariest was two years. Actually, the scariest was already, but you know, those are, those are complex questions. Um, Maslow uh, presented a model that, um, that for, for a human to become um, uh, the, the most actualized in this example, um, they first needed to have their basic needs provided, um, then safety, then love and belonging, then esteem, then we can move into the things that matter most to us. Some would say that this is a product more of your circumstance, but I believe it's more a product of how we manage ourselves and how we see ourselves. Uh, we've all been on a journey of self-love through our life. There was somebody that told us we weren't good enough somewhere along the way, and that stuck a little bit. And if we were unlucky, or maybe lucky, depending on how you look at it, there might have been a lot of people that told us that over a long period of time. And some of us might have grown up in a way where we were good enough and we got a lot of love. And so these beliefs that drive our life so regulate our outcomes in a way that's a lot more powerful than, than many people would think on a daily basis. There was another author and um, philosopher and scientist named Hawkins who came up with a different way of gradiating consciousness. Um, if we look over at the, the level here, at the top we have some abstract idea of enlightenment, which is kind of like Maslow's transcendence in many ways. Peace, joy, love. I mean, going through our life only experiencing peace, love, joy, that's the predominant emotion. I mean, that's kind of the utopian idea that we've set for. But I would say if we probably surveyed most of the people in the room, those are a little bit more elusive than, than prevalent in our life. And, and so when we look at society, uh, we see a lot of these kind of things, shame, guilt, apathy, grief, desire, uh, fear, uh, these, these sort of mm, opposing forceful ideas to the future which we want to create. And so um, for me, um, I, I first found um, both of their work when I was 24. I was diagnosed with a terminal cancer. And um, in you know, some kind of like mystery movie plot, I went on an adventure to figure out how to cure this. I hired an MD. I'd been an entrepreneur for five years, so I had some resources. I hired an MD, built a research team, and, and went out to the edge of medicine to figure out how I could make a drug to kill this cancer. Ultimately, what I saw in medicine, a particular area that's quite well accepted, psychoneuroimmunology, PNI for short, is that the way we think influences the chemistry of our body, it influences the epigenetic expression of our cells, and it ultimately forms diseases and can even somehow magically mystery, I mean, there is some mechanism that we're getting to, create spontaneous remissions where illnesses go away. And it's not so spontaneous. I found the scale and gravitated through the scale and changed my life in remarkable ways, and the cancer went away. I've written a book on it. It's coming out this year. Um, one-third science, one-third my journey, and one-third the psychology of healing and progress through this. Uh, but these scales really inspired me to think about how these models could come together into technology to sort of measure my progress in that healing journey. And I played with some biofeedback, and I had this dream that it would be available with me all the time to be able to show me where I am in, in terms of sympathetic and parasympathetic and the quality of my thoughts and my beliefs. Um, and then, obviously, there's my experience, but there's the people around me. In that journey with cancer, there were many people who reacted in strange ways. Some people looked at me, and I could see this sort of sadness and pity. It was like it was perpetuating a death sentence for me. And then there were other people that looked at me, and I said, you know, maybe I could heal. And they said, absolutely. You can do anything you set your mind to. And there was the, these gradients of experiences. And I wanted to see what it looked like to be in a place where people were were controlled or predominated by fear or whether it was elevated emotions that were possible. And so we've been working on that. And what we find is that we look at the individual experience, we can then group data. And so this is an example of a management meeting. Uh, I was trying to pull some new stats, but this is all in progress and coming. You know, a management meeting starts high and kind of drifts down. This is maybe a standard meeting. Um, that, uh, that people disengage with over time. We, we have some beautiful meetings where we have a big high and then we talk about something that's really scary, like, oh, we gotta be ready for this thing or that thing, and it drops. And then we have a discussion about, okay, what are we feeling? Why did our stats drop? And this remarkable conversation comes about fear and about I'm not good enough and I don't know how to do this and I've been holding this weight and I haven't been sleeping. Okay, cool, let's distribute that work in a new way. Let's approach this in a new way. Maybe let's change the goal and come up with something that's more reasonable or let's double down and figure out how to work as a team to do it. So we have this sort of quantified um, environment that allows us to sense emotion in a room real time. And this is an experience first that starts with us 
if anyone's been to Landmark, the idea that somebody makes you feel a certain way, uh, you kind of step out of that and realize that all of our emotions are our choice. Uh, but the people around us do make a difference. And so what would it look like if we could have real-time sensing of our family, if we were apart and we were traveling, to know how, how we're feeling and how we're doing, how we're working through the stresses of our lives before it's too late? Um, I was at XPRIZE last week with Peter Diamandis and the leadership team there working on some prizes, and I, I shared the story uh, about what we were working on, and a woman shared a story about one of her children that had committed suicide. And for her, it was a total surprise. She had no idea that that was happening. And so these kind of stories happen a lot more frequently than we think. Um, political leaders in the US have children that have similar experiences of pain, and it's totally invisible. So what would it be if it could be visible in our small environment, or in our friend network, or in our company, or in our communities? What would it look like if we gradated Vancouver based on the amount of love and peace and joy we could feel? versus the anger and frustration? What would it look like if we looked at that by day, by time, by event? These, these fascinating ideas, the old adage of what we can measure, we can manage. I mean, it sounds so linear in its approach, but really, if you can't see it in a way that's undeniable, then it's hard to, to address. And so ultimately, I have a vision for scaling this to the world. I was in San Francisco, um, I guess it was last year, and um, I went to a purpose summit that was talking about um, uh, environmental causes and equality, and people were wearing masks because everything was burning around. Houses were burning, and there was dangerous chemicals. I mean, it was pretty much like this version of, of the Earth. It was very apocalyptic. And so we, we see the temperatures in, are increasing everywhere. We see that, that war is still sort of brewing in many different ways. And so I, I look at the world, and I say, what if we could develop a new measure set that was beyond GDP? The metric that, that c countries run on national accounting and GDP um, you know, personally, I feel is a better metric for how fast we convert resources to garbage. If the entire world lived the way that the United States lives, we would need four planets right now just to be able to not collapse, probably just kaboom. I don't know what happens. Um, so, so can metrics and understanding and consciousness relate to creating a new world is really the question that I, that I pose. And, um, and for some people, this is a lot. Um, but the good news is that there's already some places that this has started. Um, there's some places that, um, some places in technologies that have started to engage with people in a way. We have digital therapy where people, if, if you've ever tried to get couples counseling, it's hard. Two people have two busy jobs, you got to go out, you meet the person, you don't really like them. I mean, it's such a complicated process, but now in a digital environment, it's much easier to access. If we think about meditation, for anybody that doesn't meditate, if you've tried, it's like, I can't do it more than a couple minutes. That was me once upon a time, <laughs> like five minutes of, of hell, literally. Uh, now, five hours, no problem. Uh, but there were tools and people that helped me with that. So in a digital environment, we allow to bring that technology to people, that growth, that, 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 that ability to actualize new parts of themselves. In a, in a way that has low cost and, and easy accessibility. And then there are various movements around um, how artificial intelligence and um, ambassador programs are working. Um, the, 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 the good news about these sort of sparks of consciousness and how technology is helping people is that there's massive industries and organizations that have big problems. Uh, a major challenge that a company like TELUS will deal with is reskilling of people. 85% um, of jobs disappearing in the next 10 years. What does that mean? Well, if we're sitting here, it means something very different than it means to the truck driver who's sitting at home who can't make rent or put food on the table. And so these issues are going to face all of us. And large organizations, if they're going to exist, are going to need to confront them. So what are we doing? We're creating a platform. We're measuring consciousness, emotion. We're creating content and conversational agent to help people make better decisions to choose the emotions and the experience that they have, and then we're interlinking people in new ways that bring more love and peace and joy into the world so that maybe we can chart a different outcome. How are we going to get people on board with that? Ultimately, it's one-to-one. -one. The experience that, that we create through our technology relates to stories, and those stories can scale. I think everybody that's in a position of influence these days is, is either feeling like it's time for them to say something that's that's, that's meaningful, that changes the trajectory of humanity, or they're feeling pressure from their customers to shift into that direction. I suppose there are still some people driving around in supercars that don't really care about the world, uh, but progressively more and more that's something that's fading away into what's your purpose, what's your why? 
Um, good news, younger generations are adapting these digital tools faster than they ever have. There's a balance, there's some destructive natures of technology and there's some positive natures of technology, but we have a really good momentum curve. And there are some leaders out there that are talking about these exact kind of concepts I'm speaking about today. Some of those you know. There's many more that are not on this board. They, 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 I would call the, um, the, the, the essence of what we're speaking about. There's lots of other larger audiences that, that expand um, for the reaches. Um, one of the people that's not in here, a friend of mine, Andrew Yang, who's a Democratic candidate in the United States. I think he's still in the running last check. Universal income is something he's talking about. Um, we, we, we jam pretty tightly around the idea of universal income and how we distribute by emotion and how to help people elevate consciousness. I mean, that's now taking a, a national and a global stage. There's trials all around Europe with, with distributed income and universal income. Um, and then, so, so we speak about like what our target audiences are as a business. I mean, targeted audiences feel so, um, so, so business-like in some ways, but um, ultimately, who are we bringing on board? There's people that, that realize the benefit of peacefulness and technology. There's people that are the hardcore biohackers that, are, that have been using these tools for a long time and just want better tools. There are people that, um, that are focused around health and wellness in a way that it really matters. If you had a... Uh, diagnosis of anxiety or depression or some kind of autoimmune or we're dealing with something like cancer, the data is pretty clear that if you feel better about life, if you feel better about yourself and life, if you feel a sense of peace, that you both live longer and can heal. And these are really abstract ideas for people. What if we could create a measurement tool for that? So these are all things that are in progress. Telling these stories Digitally is easier than it's ever been. Success stories can replicate. Re replicate. We see unicorns popping out of out of out of nowhere. And ultimately, for me, it stopped being about money a long time ago. It's about impact, and it's about saving lives, and it's about creating this better world. Um, companies, hopefully, will be partners in this adventure. I think the companies that are partners in this will survive and thrive, and the companies that are not will will fade away. Because ultimately, people progressively feel this desire to be more purposeful and heart-centered. But in large organizations, sometimes that's challenging. As we speak about GDP as a metric that's causing destruction, destruction and havoc in our world, um, I mean, once upon a time it was useful, but not anymore from my perspective. Um, companies are the same. What does a triple bottom look like actualized? How do we measure the health and well-being and mindset and emotional experience of an organization? These are questions that have been hard to establish. Um, but we see the issues. We see people disengaging turnover absenteeism, illness emerging in particular places. Um, and then we see the, the, the success. We see employee satisfaction increasing, improved productivity, uh, greater financial stability for individuals and for organizations. Um, we see people engaging in their work. In, and enhanced creativity is a big factor. Creativity is a big word for what comes in this future that's, that's so uncertain. How do we perform in high stress, rapid change environments that require brilliant ideas all the time? Do we perform where it's just too much, or are we able to exist in a place where we're adaptive and creative and can bring our greatest truths forward? Um, this is a lot of stuff. So is science on board with you? Good question. Uh, the answer is yes. This is not a new field. The EEG was invented in the earliest, early 20th century. It's been 100 years since we've, we've used biorhythms to manage and determine consciousness, but we haven't been able to, or no one has, moved it into a digital ecosystem where it's real time and empowered in a way that can connect individuals and organizations in new ways. Um, we, we Collectively, the science establishes that, that people get better from anxiety, anxiety and depression by seeing their emotion in real time, um, enhanced creativity. Um, there's a great study um, associated biofeedback association, um, music performance anxiety, so the quality of music goes up and people are able to be more creative in their experience. Um, and then many diseases are able to be reversed. Um, also, uh, uh, looking at the impression upon more serious diseases, lots of data on that, so I could fill you know, 10 slides about our scientific validation. In, in our world, in our platform, it's things we're working on. We have partnerships with major organizations to, to create that. Um, and internally, um, our team of people, I guess just, just going through, there's, there's me, um, and um, just drawing your attention to those two little bars at the bottom, um, that's uh, radical transparency. Uh, as a leader, to, to be able to show who I am in real time. We're not quite there. Soon we'll have my emotional state um, on the screen as we go through. Um, wild ideas, right? What would it look like if we saw the White House gradient before, after, during? <laughs> 
right? It'd be fascinating, right? It, oh, look, they're rocking it on love and compassion and empathy. Look at all that. No, that doesn't seem real, does it? No, no. I don't think it would say that, actually. Um, so as a leader, I've, I've been through, I've been, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. I've, I've played in aggressive U.S. politics. I scaled a business to $100 million in revenue and then wrestled with the FDA and various regulatory agencies to help people in a way that was contrary to the policies. Um, I've navigated it successfully, but at certain times I've lost who I was. I've, I've experienced stress and pressure in a way that it got control of me. To have a real-time measure that I share with the world is a fascinating and very scary idea. Uh, but what's cool is some other people feel the same way. Our head of product, Tanya, loves that idea. Uh, I think somehow she was behind this going on the slide. Um, and uh, product development in many different segments, bringing those together. Um, uh, Quan, um, beautiful, beautiful man. He, um, he was working in the, the medical space with FDA and ultrasound and making hard, antiquated uh, technology into something that you can bring into your house, sort of that tricorder journey of now I can see and heal myself in different ways. Um, and navigating all those regulatory infrastructures. Um, I, I knew he was our guy when he uh, told me that he was into Star Wars. <laughs> I mean, this is all kind of Star Wars-y, right? Um, <laughs> we, we, I've asked five times to get that photo replaced. This deck just came to me like 30 minutes before I showed up here. So um, he looks like an evil scientist, but Fouad actually is a radiation physicist and nuclear engineer. Uh, he's been funding uh, side projects with us. And hey, you know, again, some of you may think this guy's totally crazy, but as we talk about that intersection between Newtonian physics and quantum physics, there are fascinating manifestations of human consciousness in the world that are now measurable. And so he leads up our giving in that area uh, to various researchers around the world that are ex following things like, um, like PK or retrocausality. Um, premonition, you know, how does nonlinear time experience in our world? We know in a lab it's real, but do humans have anything to do with that? So as we quantify consciousness, we start to see some really remarkable effects there. Uh, take that as you will. Uh, don't burn me at a stake after, please. Um, Wendy, our CFO, has been involved in numerous technologies um, in the city. She was one of the key people that built Crystal Decisions um, and, and helped scale that, as well as a number of other successful startups. And Julian, um, fascinating, was with a company called Mio before, uh, which got acquired by um, uh, Huami, and his security protocols, technology, and algorithms um, have reached 30 million people plus. Um, so that kind of scale is what we're building into our architecture to make this work. And then ultimately, the kind of vision that I'm talking about requires uh, a lot of sizable partners. So in my journey as an entrepreneur, these are the, the organizations or individuals in key positions of power in these organizations that have really got excited about this concept and have been supporting us in this journey. Um, some of those, you know, you could see $90 billion organizations. Um, we're working on a, we're working on a, a, a trial with... Um, uh, with Anthem, they, they want to run in their digital healthcare business, our metrics, uh, in their leadership team, which I'm really excited about, a little bit nervous about. So we're, uh, we're working on getting that already for the first part of the new year. Uh, and Stanford has been a big supporter in our work in advancing our technology. Um, so, I mean, to close up here, ultimately, the, um, the Blue Planet moment um, Edgar Mitchell was famous for, um, going up to space and looking at the planet and seeing like it's this thing that we live in, you know, it just puts it into perspective. The decisions we make will either allow this thing to alive and thrive or, or die. Uh, we sit at this time where the decisions we're making on a collective humanity basis is threatening our existence as a whole. There are all kinds of terrible narratives that emerge, but I think that a beautiful one is possible. And I think that starts directly with us in our individual experience of how we live moment to moment. As we go through traffic in the moment, is it like, F you, get out of my way. Eh, eh, eh. Or is it like, hey, look, that person's a little stressed. I'm just going to give them a little love and let them on their way. These moments in the hallway, in the boardroom, in the times that we're frustrated, can we come to a place that makes a better decision? And then can we somehow utilize technology to scale that? I think we can. Thanks for having me here. I found the content and presentation very intriguing, and it's exciting to see technology being used in a very new and different way. So our initial reaction was uh, when Steve finished speaking, we looked at each other and said, wow. Uh, so we, we definitely were blown away by what he had to say, and uh, ex extremely um, articulate speaker and uh, a good communicator. I think that went okay. 
I got that um, I got that deck like we got it like 30 minutes before, and then we did like a quick 10 minute roll through, and uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's something we I care a lot about. I thought it was a really interesting idea coming from the background of mental health and psychology, just the intersection of our technological world with um, therapy and making you know, individuals' lives better, making communities possibly healthier. I think it's really exciting. It gets you thinking, right? I mean, uh, it's just, and that's the, 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 the nugget of, uh, of, of some sort of development of a new way of communicating. That's what I'm getting from that. I think it's just the beginning of, hey, how do we, how do we more accurately know when to engage our teams? That's cool.